as I look out at all of you, I realize I'm dealing with a challenged, a challenged group. <laughs> now, what is that challenge? Sometimes when you give a sermon, especially we have a particular uh, mass circuit on Sunday, Wisconsin afternoon mass, kind of late, you know, two, three in the afternoon. It's there's no air conditioning in the church. It gets real warm. Everybody gets comfortable. And you have to, the secret to giving a sermon there is be short enough where they don't have time to fall asleep. So, but we're challenged because there wasn't enough coffee this morning. So if I see anybody falling asleep, I'm going to ask somebody to tell me what their name tag is and I'll wake you up, okay? (laughs) An An added element of fear. Every year for the conference, we have to think of a theme. And Father Mary Benedict was saying, we haven't had a theme yet. We've got to come up with something. And I said, well, please ask Sister at the center to come up with a list of all the different conference titles, themes, etc. And so I get a fax, and it starts on the top with 1967. So I think this is 49 or 50. <clears throat> so you look through the list and thinking, how much more can we squeeze out of a title here? There's so much to be, you know, spoken about of Our Lady of Fatima, but there's so many themes that have already been used. And I really thought hard about what would be appropriate on the 100th anniversary of Our Blessed Mother's apparition. Things are much different today than they were 100 years ago or even 50 years ago because we're in a very much different circumstance in the church. We have, unfortunately, not in great numbers, but a few here, a few there, of people that are losing their faith. And why do they lose their faith? For probably many different reasons. And so I thought how appropriate it would be if we had Fatima and Perseverance. Because it'd be one thing to know the message of Fatima, be able to tell somebody else what the message of Fatima was. But if we're not living that message ourselves, it could be a a spiritual poison. Like St. Louis de Montfort speaks about in True Devotion to Mary, he talks about how if we take this consecration, we don't live it, it could turn on us and become a spiritual poison. Because to whom much is given, we read in Scripture, much is expected. And so it's with this in mind that we like to speak about Fatima and perseverance. The first thing I'd like to speak about very briefly is there is no doubt in my mind that we are living in some very troublesome times, unprecedented. I was very fearful for our country how much time we would have if a certain Hillary Clinton would have gotten elected how quickly and rapidly our country would have gone to become socialistic, immoral, and things have been slowed down a little bit. But you see in the media all the elements of evil are there to destroy our country, to destroy our children's faith. Here in Washington State, beautiful, beautiful state, I mean, at least picturesque-wise, landscape-wise, but... very liberal state. And the state law is that if someone thinks, uh, a a male thinks he's a female, he can use a woman's restroom and vice versa. It just absolutely is mind-boggling that we have come to this juncture in the history of our country and society. It would be like you walking into a hospital and saying, I think I'm a doctor. Where is the operating room? (laughs) Sorry. The psych ward's over here, you know. (laughs) But it's really what St. Paul spoke about in his epistle to the Corinthians. There will come a time in which men will not endure sound doctrine, but with itching ears will heap to themselves teachings according to their own lusts and desires. I, I have to laugh. I, I'm sure some of you have seen this. People send me lots of things, but somebody was interviewing some 
college students uh, over on the west coast here, state of Washington. And this fellow, he must have been in his 30s, he said, it was kind of funny. He said, what if I, uh, what if I, he's asking them, different students, what if I thought I was a woman, I told you I'm a woman? What would you think about that? Well, good for you, the answer was, good for you. And, and, and congratulations, and uh, we respect you. Okay. He said, well, let me ask you another question. What if you thought, what if I thought that I was Chinese? And uh, they say, well, if, if that's what you think, good for you. And I respect you, and, and congratulations. He said, but do you think I'm Chinese? Well, I don't know. You don't look Chinese to me. What if I thought I was a second grader, and I won't go back to second grade? And he's interviewing all these different young people, and they're saying, well, I think that we can accommodate that. So he says, oh, so if, if I think I'm a second grader, that I'm you know, seven years old, I should be allowed to go to a second grade classroom and be accepted into that classroom. And they were looking a little puzzled, but they said, yeah, we could. I th- I'm sure they could <clears throat> make room for you too, <clears throat> get a desk big enough for you to fit, something like that. And then he said, what if I thought I was six foot five? And if I, the fellow's only like 5'10", they said, well, hmm, uh, I would ask you, why do you think you're six foot five? Because you're not that tall. So he said, well, let's put this all together. You're saying it's okay for me, for me, as a guy, to say I could be a seven-year-old, second-grade Chinese woman that's six foot five, and that's all okay. Don't you realize how, buzz, how bizarre that is? We're supposed to lie to ourselves. There's supposedly no objective truth or reality. It's whatever you make it. It's all subjective. If you think you're this, you think you're that, then good for you, and we have to respect that with rights and privileges and all those other crazy things. But that's the world we live in today. And truly, <clears throat> this, I would say this subjectivism, this, this liberalism extends to all areas, not most importantly morality, but also very importantly and most importantly too is in theology too. A certain relativism that is, it doesn't matter what religion you are. You worship different gods as a Hindu, oh, good for you. Oh, you're, you don't believe there's a god, you're a Buddhist? Uh, that's good too. You're a Muslim and you think that Muhammad was the great prophet and that Jesus was just a prophet, wasn't the son of God, you deny the Trinity. That's okay too. It becomes all watered down where there is no objective truth anymore. It's whatever anybody wants to think of it. We have, unfortunately today, you know, players, NFL players, kneeling down for the national anthem, making a statement, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the sad thing is, and this is really interesting, there was a very conservative and very educated commentator that said, what do these players know? They get on the radio or they get on in front of a camera and they start expounding about history and this and that and how they've been exploited and they're this and that. But the point is, is this. The real sad thing is, is that just because you can catch a football or tackle somebody doesn't mean you're an expert in everything. And when it comes to our flag, we should respect the flag. When it comes to our country, we should love our country. Just put soldiers defending our country and laying down their life for our country. And same thing with police as well. Are there areas of, of obviously, um, things that need uh, to be corrected? Yes, but they're not as widespread. They're not all that common as, as they're making it out to be. So we have some very challenging times in which we live. But the important thing for us is this. As we see our society crumbling around us, as we see the situation of the church become very, very desperate, that word up there, Fatima, and the other word, perseverance, go hand in hand. Because we will not persevere in the faith unless we live that message of Our Lady of Fatima. Another thing to ponder just briefly is what our Lord said in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18. 
He said, think ye, when the Son of Man comes, he's going to find faith on the earth. When our Lord comes a second time, is he going to find faith on the earth? What does that mean? That means, surely, that for the most part, it's going to be very hard to find faith on the earth. That mankind, having turned its back on God and rejected divine revelation, has gone down that spiral path to perdition. And as each year goes by, it's going to be harder and harder for us to live our faith and to be able to especially raise our children into faith. So I'm going to have two parts to this talk. The first part I want to just talk about, we were mentioning upstairs in the sermon during Mass, we need to create a Catholic atmosphere in our homes. We need to create a Catholic atmosphere in our lives. If we don't do that, all the knowledge of the faith and everything else is going to be nothing if we don't practice the faith. And this is where we start out with that very basic thing. It's all a matter of God's grace. God's grace. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, nearly 2,000 years ago, walked this earth visibly amongst men, all who saw him, they, they had seen the miracles he had worked. He had raised people from the dead. Cripples were cured. Lepers were cleansed. People blind could see. And of all the people back then who were living, those who should have seen it most clearly were the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the experts in the law. They knew scripture. They knew the prophecies. And yet, with all their knowledge and their position in the temple and in the synagogue, these scribes and Pharisees are the very ones who rejected Christ. And not only rejected him, but called for his crucifixion. And that is a very, very scary thing. It is a very scary thing when you see spiritual blindness. Very, very scary. Because when people are spiritually blind, you could present things right in front of them, and they, I shouldn't say they can't see it, they won't see it. We have so many examples of that in the history of the church. They take, for example, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a priest, very active in writing and preaching and carrying on so many different works for the Augustinians, and yet he neglected his prayer life. He also had a very terrible problem with scrupulosity, and he'd go from one extreme to the other of prayers and not praying and being so active, and he left the priesthood. He left the Holy Catholic Church. And what did he say? Here I stand and I can't do other eyes. Mind you, this is the 500th anniversary of Luther breaking with the church, nailing his thesis on the, the door of the cathedral. Here I stand, Luther said. Here I stand, and I can't do otherwise. My conscience and scripture are my guide. And so what did he say? He said, the church for 1,500 years was wrong, and now I got it right. <laughs> that is incredible blindness, absolutely incredible blindness. Then you have shortly after him, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, the king of England, writes a defense of the Catholic faith and the seven sacraments against Luther. But Henry VIII had his own personal problem with purity, not being faithful to his, the queen, Queen Catherine. And as we know, when the pope would not give him an, an annulment of his marriage, then he said, I don't need no pope to tell me. And so what did he do? He led the Church of England into schism. And it didn't matter all his predecessors, all those kings who ruled England, didn't matter, and none of that mattered, because he, in his mind, had convinced himself that he had no marriage and the Pope's not going to tell him what to do and he's the head of the church in England. And you know, when people become blind, they really go off the deep end very quickly. If you read, St. Alphonsus Liguori has a book called The History of Heresies. 
And I just want to tell you this. If you are a bookworm and like to read, read The History of Heresies by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Excellent book. And it, it is so intriguing because he goes into so many different details about the different heresies. And with regard to Henry VIII, he repeats something that I had read in another book about Henry VIII, that when it was become known that he was going to put away Queen Catherine and Mary Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn's father approached Henry VIII and said, don't marry her, she's your illegitimate daughter. And Henry VIII said, get out of here, be gone. Because Henry VIII, as much as he was the defender of the faith, he had that particular weakness in that particular area. And as we know, he put Anne Boleyn to death, and he got married to another, and another, and another, and another. Very, very tragic and complete, absolute blindness. We also have today, too, we're going to jump all the way ahead to 50 years ago. Vatican II comes along an ecumenical council, and they begin to introduce things that are completely, absolutely, positively against what the Catholic Church taught in the past. A stark break with the past. We want to just very briefly get into that topic dogmatically, but I want to get back to the morals, creating that Catholic atmosphere in your homes so that you don't become spiritually blinded by the things of this world because you know spiritual falls don't happen you know out of the blue there's been a process of maybe cutting corners spiritually compromising making peace with certain particular sins and then that brings you down spiritually and as our lord tells us Nothing should get in the way of our getting to heaven. Nothing. If your eye be of scandal to thee, and our Lord's not telling us to main ourselves, but as dear as our eyesight is, pluck out your eye. Your hand of scandal, cut it off. Foot of scandal, cut it off. Better to go to heaven with one eye, one foot, one hand, than go to hell with both eyes, both hands, both feet. And so what I'd like to just share with you is just a couple of things especially those you live in a Catholic community like Mount St. Michael's, you have the opportunity to go to Mass more often than just once on Sunday. That's something that you should really take advantage of. The, the Mass is such a treasury of graces, the renewal of Christ's death on the cross, unto the remission of sins. Do we have sins to atone for in our personal lives in the past? There's no better way than to assist at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. To receive our Lord's body and blood in Holy Communion often, frequently. I, I believe, no doubt in my mind, there's certainly a relationship between, as Father Benedict was saying yesterday, the angel of Portugal appearing to the Fatima children before Our Lady appeared and talking about the outrage, the sacrilegious and indifference that our Lord was being offended by in the sacrament of his love. I remember when I was a little boy, I made my first communion. And, uh, you know, when you're making your first communion, you're in second grade and you're very impressionable. I remember Sister Mary Grace saying, we're going to have 40 hours adoration. How important it is that everybody be there so that there's not one hour left without our Lord being there. I remember going on a Saturday morning and uh, there was probably three or four people there. And I was praying some prayers and wanted to make a holy hour, but I was sure afraid. I hope, no, I hope somebody else comes in because I can't spend all morning here. You know, I don't want to, we can't leave our Lord by himself. But the tragedy is we're talking about a parish of 500 families, 500 families. We had 1,000 kids in our grade school, and we had like five masses on Sunday. And there's just a few people there for adoration, you know, I'm not going to judge anybody why they were there or they weren't there or whatever, but I firmly believe truly that Vatican II came along as, a, as also a punishment because of taking for granted the graces of our faith and the opportunities of grace with the Mass and the sacraments. And so I think, you know, trying to create a Catholic atmosphere, very important. Try to make it to Mass often. 
It's a sacrifice. If you just tried maybe during Lent to say, you know, I'm going to go to Mass every morning. I've got to get up early and make it to that whatever time the Mass is. You've got to get up in a cold car and drive up to the mount and roads might be slick and, you know, get into the church and they don't heat these places like they should, huh? You know, so. <laughs> but those are sacrifices. And, you know, when you love somebody, two things. You want to be with them and you want to sacrifice for them. If we love Jesus, then let's want to be with him in, in church, and we also want to show our love for him by making generously those sacrifices. That no problem. Happy to do it. Happy to be here, Lord, because you have given me this greatest of treasures, your real presence in a, in a tabernacle. With regard to prayers, how important it is, especially families, your children, you make sure that they get in the habit of praying the rosary every single day. It takes how many times to do something before it becomes a habit? What do they say? 14 times, 21 times, 3 times. Somebody said 3. If you do it regularly, it becomes a habit. And that's what we need to do is to form in our children good habits. Wearing the brown scapular, praying prayers as a family, praying night prayers as a family. I'll share with you a very brief story. I told this a couple years back. But I know there are many of you that aren't, weren't here back then, and some of you, this is your first conference. And for those who've heard it, you could take your snooze now, okay? <laughs> we had a fella who moved his family from Los Angeles to Omaha, and uh, his name was Don Steffes. He was retired. His children were grown up. They were all married and had kids and whatever. And he prayed a 15 decade rosary every day. And not only that, but he prayed to Stations of the Cross every day. In fact, a lot of our students, they didn't know he was, the, he was called the, the Stations of the Cross guy because he's always in there praying to Stations of the Cross. One time we had tornado warnings, sirens are going, and he's leaving his house, and his poor wife said, Don't go, Don, we're going to die. And <laughs> got to pray my Stations of the Cross. And he just drive down the road. Well, interestingly, um, Don had come to me and said, you know, Bishop, I really have a really bad heart condition. Uh, arteries are very brittle. Uh, there's not a whole lot they can do. And he was wondering, I, you know, about the surgery and whatever. So finally it came to the point where couldn't put it off. They had to do the surgery. So he was at the VA and uh, went to see him, bring, bring him Holy Communion. He had already been ex you know, anointed. And uh, I was putting a blessed sacrament down and lighting the candles, and he was rolling out of bed. I said, I whispered, Don, you don't have to get out of bed. You could, no, I'm kneeling. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. He kneels down, gave him Holy Communion. He received our Lord very devoutly, um, helped him get, get back into bed. I said, Don, I have this happy death crucifix. On the back it says, you get a plenary indulgence at the hour of death of your kistus with love and sorrow for your sins. Love for God and sorrow for your sins. And, and I said, Don, I only got two of these, so don't lose it. And he squeezes us, save it with my life. Okay? Well, this was on Friday. So Saturday comes, and I'm thinking Saturday evening, I got three masses, I got to drive over six hours. His, his surgery is on Monday. Probably won't get to see him again. He might not make it. This is my last chance. So zipped over to the VA, talked to him again. I said, Don, I won't be there for you know your surgery because I get back real late on Sunday night, but I'll be praying for you. And uh, so that was that. So I got back Sunday night late, and then I had to get right up in the morning for school, teach his classes, and I'm having an afternoon mass around noon. And right after mass, Father Gregory hands me a note, go to the hospital, Don's not going to make it. So he zipped over to the hospital, his wife is crying, his adult children are crying, and they just said, the doctor just said, there's nothing to do for him, we're going to lose dad. Now, this is the thing that I hadn't heard, but when he was at the VA, before they switched him from the VA to another hospital, I think Nebraska Medical Center, his daughters, who are adults, they're in their 30s, they have children, they said, Dad, we really want to know if you make it. Could you send us a sign? And you know, when I hear these things, I go, yeah, I know about this stuff. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, can God send signs? Absolutely. 
I'll tell you about my sign later. But <laughs> <laughs> So the sign was, send us a white rose. Okay, sounds good to me. Well, so I ran over there Monday afternoon, and I got into him, and he was really in bad shape. You could see struggling, etc. Said some prayers. He had already been anointed, got the apostolic blessing, received Holy Viaticum. There's nothing more I can do. Said some prayers. And I talked to his wife, and I just said, you know, if you really need me to come back, I'd go back for class, but if you need me to come back, I'll come back. Just call any time, etc. So this is with a point I didn't hear because I wasn't there. But about 3, 4 in the morning, he was surrounded by his wife and children, passed away. They were praying around his bed. The nurses asked everybody, could you please get out? We're going to disconnect him, take the tube out of his mouth and disconnect him and kind of clean him up a little bit. And one of the nurses, as they put him, they had the family, you know, go to the, you know, the waiting room there. One of the nurses thought, you know, it'd be really nice. She had a rose and it was a right a white rose and put it on his chest. So when that family, the mom and adult boys and girls, the young men, women, come into the come into the way the, the the room where their dad was, she saw that white rose. They saw that white rose and they only been waiting fifteen minutes. And she picked that up and her hand was trembling. And she went to the nurse and her hand's trembling, like, Who put this on my husband? That nurse thought she was gonna get fired. <laughs> like <laughs> Sorry, lady, I didn't want to offend anybody. <laughs> like, She said, no, you have no idea what this means to, to us. This was answer to our prayers. Fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes after he died, they got a sign that he was going to be okay. But you know, when it comes to God's grace, it's like the air we breathe. If we don't breathe, we're not going to live. So we need to pray and pray well. We need to not only pray well, but create that atmosphere in our homes where we're going to become holy. And when it comes to occasions of sin, got to cut them out. Now, I'm not going to beat around the bush. It is extremely important for parents especially to keep their children from occasions of sin. Bad movies, bad TV, bad music, unsupervised Internet disaster now I have an advantage of like I can see most of our parishes around the country visit them somewhat often I know most of the people in our parishes and I get bits and pieces of the downfalls of sometimes individual children because of a lack of supervision getting on the internet and losing their innocence very very quickly and it's addicting too the pornography the obscenity on the internet is mind-boggling. It is so absolutely positively perverse. And you can't be careful enough. You want your children to lose their faith, and purity is a very good way they're going to do that. Because like St. Thomas Aquinas says, impurity blinds someone, like with the case of Henry VIII. They can lose their innocence so easily, so quickly. You can't be careful enough. And I would say if the end is occasion of sin, the TV is occasion of sin, go to a hardware store and get a sledgehammer and smash it because it's not worth your kids or anybody going to hell for that. I'm not saying that they should live in a cave and be totally sheltered. Obviously not. But you have to take all the safeguards necessary to preserve their purity. If you don't, you're going to lose them. It's very, very tragic to hear of, children losing their innocence because they got involved with something or saw something or got into something that was just... And now they're going to carry that temptation, those images, those thoughts, the rest of their life. That's the reason why when we say the Hail Mary, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. St. Gabriel, the Passionist, Francis Pocenti, 24 years old, he died as a Passionist religious, and when he was dying... He was being tormented by all those things that he saw out in the world. And he kept asking the priest to, to bless him and, and absolve him. He was just struggling. And you know, you don't want that to be the downfall of any of your children. So be very attentive in that area. Same thing with regard to school. 
I'm not saying that your children shouldn't go for higher education, but I, it's been my experience, unfortunately, that our schools, the universities, colleges have become so godless and so pagan that how many lose their faith going to school? That can happen to anyone. And so if they are going to go for higher education, as parents, you should be very concerned, if you're, especially if you're footing the bill, you should make sure that that precious gift of the faith is not lost because of some atheist professor or some humanist professor who's going to say there's no God and, and man could do what he wants and there's no morality, et cetera, et cetera. Because those, the atmospheres, even in so-called colleges that are supposedly Catholic, which they're not, permeates with immorality, permeates with godlessness, permeates with all these different errors and how do you think your children are not going to go through that and not get tainted by that kind of stuff? There is a thing called the Index of Forbidden Books. I'm not sure how often the priest mentioned this, but the church has listed books. If they're against faith and morals, you're forbidden as Catholics to read them because Holy Mother of the Church is a concerned mother. You shouldn't even have those types of books in your home. Don't think, well, you know, we're Catholics. We were raised Catholic. This is not going to happen to us. This past summer, this one woman wanted me to talk to her daughter. Her daughter got into yoga, and from yoga into Eastern concepts, Eastern mysticism, etc. Then he was talking about the third eye, the chakra, and now doesn't even know if there's a God, there's an energy out there. And this energy, I don't know, we don't know much about this energy, and, you know, and about Christ, well, you know, he was an he was extraordinary person, uh, lost her faith. We talked to her about two hours, and we went. Let's. I just said, let's go through this very, very simply. Is there a God? And we just start giving all the different proofs from causality, intelligent design. I said, how do you explain this, 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 this? That is evidence beyond dispute, unless you're totally absurd and irrational to say that happened by accident. The creator is an intelligent designer. There's harmony, there's order, there's purpose in the natural world. You can't deny that. Talked about Christ. I said, you know, all of history is centered around the life of Christ. Jesus' birth is the focal point of all history. We don't do that for everybody and anybody. And you know what about this person, Christ? His followers said, he worked miracles. They said he raised people from the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He did all these wonderful things. How do you explain that they were not denounced as a bunch of liars? You guys making this stuff up. It has never happened. Even his enemies, the Jews who rejected Christ, the Pharisees, scribes, who wrote horrible things about him. The best argument that they should have used against him if those miracles never happened was he never did those things. It's all make up. It's all make believe. You guys are, this is all fraud. But even his enemies could not, they did not because they could not deny his miracles. They worked in front of everybody, publicly witnessed by everyone. And so sure were those miracles that even his enemies didn't deny it. And not only that, but there are people that were contemporary with those events that could go and verify those things that they did happen. And so with this person, this historical person, Christ, you have a very tough, difficult issue to say those things never happened because his, his followers are making some very bold claims that we read of in the Gospels. How do you get around that, that these things never happened? And if Christ was everything he claimed to be, and he was, and not only that, besides the miracles, there were prophecies made long before he came. He fulfilled them perfectly. How do you explain that? One prophecy that Christ himself made about Jerusalem that would be destroyed. The enemies would come and build a rampart about them and beat them flat to the ground. 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed, utterly obliterated. The temple, not a stone upon a stone. Exactly why Christ said it would happen. And not only that, but you go to the Holy Land today, and you see the destruction of where the temple was. There's only like stones that they say might be the foundation, and they put their hand against it, the wailing wall. 
The Jews for the last 2,000 years have had no temple worship, temple priest, none of that. It's all gone. History. So how important it is to protect your children, protect ourselves. Don't think that we're un, you know, we're, uh, invincible and can't fall and it's impossible, etc., etc. It can go to anyone, priest, religious, anyone. And that's the reason why we always have to be on our guard, live Our Lady's message at Fatima in order to persevere. What are the other things insofar as we can do to create a Catholic atmosphere? Make sure your children associate with Catholics. This is interesting. We had, unfortunately, a seminarian about a year ago who got into spiritual trouble, doctrinal trouble by becoming a Fenite. And it didn't matter to him if you quote from canon law. Canon law says, canon 1239, number 2, that catechumens who die without any fault of their own, without baptism, are to be treated as baptized, to be given ecclesiastical burial. H- how, do you, how do you get around that? This was promulgated by Pope Benedict XV, enforced by him, Pope Pius XI, Pope Pius XII, three popes. Fifty years of this being inculcated. And what did he say? Canon law is a zero. You don't have to accept canon law because it's not for the universal church, which is really bogus because those canons for the Latin rite that pertain to divine law are for all Catholics, both Eastern rite and Western rite Catholics, Latin Catholics and Byzantine Catholics. It's for everyone. St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church, says it is de fide that men are saved by Baptism of desire, as is found from the Council of Trent, session whatever. St. Alphonsus Liguori is not infallible. He's a zero. I don't know where he thought he was coming from. Totally crazy. Absolutely tragic. So he found someone to ordain him, and uh, he's on this crusade that there is no baptism of desire, And the church has been wrong for all these years. Total blindness. But here's another thing. Let's be honest with you. He he was challenging me on something that we allow a little bit. We have a school in Omaha, and we allow the boys and girls after school to get together for a little bit. We have 40-something boarders. Some of them are brothers and sisters, so a chance for them to see each other because they're away from home. We have parents coming up to pick up their kids. So in front of the whole parish, these kids are meeting in front of the church. Everyone gets to meet. And they was dead set against that. Nope, we've got to keep these boys and girls totally separate. Just tell them, nope, and nope, and nope. I said, well, that's pretty nice. We could control the border kids, but how about the families? And this, his idea was, well, we'll just tell the parents this is our property, and your kids can't associate with the other kids. You've got to get off the property. You know what? I won't even tell you what I said (laughs) because it wasn't too bad. But (laughs) I said I wasn't a donkey, and we're not going to do this, okay? I said, that is utterly crazy. You see, sometimes people get into a tangent of saying, I'm going to be more Catholic than the Catholic Church. The bigger picture for me is this. I want Catholics to marry Catholics. There's an impediment, or for reason, there's an impediment in canon law. Catholics should not marry non-Catholics. The church tolerates it, allows it for a greater good, but ideally, and very importantly, especially, we need Catholics to marry Catholics. Now, obviously, we don't condone dating, going steady, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Do I know some boys like some girls and some girls like some boys? Duh. Yeah, I knew it. Okay. But you know, this this past month or this past two three months, we've had four, we have four weddings. One at the end of this month here, but four weddings. And the neatest thing is that these kids went to our school. 
and I know they have a good background. I feel really good about them getting married. And I'm not saying that, you know, if someone got married to a non-Catholic, oh, shame on you and this and that. There are circumstances, situations that occur, and we allow it, etc. But ideally, we want Catholics to marry Catholics. And that's the reason why, as a group, when, when high school students socialize as a group, they get to know each other, they get to build friendships with many boys and many girls, and if something, you know, develops later on, great, absolutely great. So the point to be made is this. We're talking about creating a Catholic atmosphere. I think it's really important when you create a void by saying can't have this and can't have that and not doing this and not doing that, you have to fill that void with something. And that's the reason why as adults, especially for our children, we have to be smarter. We have to figure out things that we're going to be able to have them do that's going to be fun and interesting. Most importantly, yes, their prayer life, the Catholic atmosphere at home with regard to Mass and the sacraments and family rosary and night prayers, etc. But also doing things that they're going to have so much fun and activities that they're not going to want to do those things that are illicit or inappropriate. Pope Pius XII, he said, youth are full of energy. And you have to channel that energy in the right direction. If you channel it in the right direction, then you won't have to be suppressing it with all your nerves frazzled uh, because they're going in the wrong direction. But how important it is to create a Catholic atmosphere in your homes because if, if you don't, by and large, your children, their faith is going to be weak. And I can just foresee as the years go on how liberal and godless our society is, that unless they're really strong in the faith, they're going to get blown away. They're going to lose it. They're going to get knocked over because these are not times in which we can be playing games with our faith and playing games with our spiritual life. Okay, that being said, we wanted to get into some of the doctrinal issues. Um, what are some of the doctrinal issues that confront us today? It really boggles my mind when I find that there are people who were raised as traditional Catholics and now in their young adulthood going back to the Novus Ordo. And especially in the year 2017, like, where is a room I can scream? Where's a, ball, a wall I can bang my head against? If it wasn't clearer today than ever, it's, it's so obviously clear. It is so crazy. Even the secular world recognizes there's something wrong. There's something wrong with this Jorge Borgoglio. Francis I, there's something really, really wrong with him. And this is why I like to give you some ammo. You know, he's got plenty of ammo. You never want to run out of ammo, okay? <laughs> I have a little article that I photocopied. I won't tell you who, so don't sue me for copyrights. <laughs> but it's a list of Francis's accomplishments. <laughs> And before we get into his accomplishments, we want to say something about the Sixth and the Ninth Commandment. Sometimes people wonder, what's the bottom line on the commandments? Well, if you think about it, the commandments are beautiful, wonderful, because our Lord and Almighty God knows all of our obligations. The first three commandments pertain to God. The next seven pertain to our neighbor. And when it comes to the sixth and the ninth commandments, it's all about the family. The family is the basic unit of society. Children, the way they're raised, in a stable environment with a mom and a dad, uh, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, they're going to do much better than a, a single-parent home. And it's not to say I don't look down upon single-parent homes, especially single moms that are trying to do their best. Maybe things, that, if things went awry, husband left them. Uh, I feel sorry for them. We really go out of our way to try to help their kids out. But it's all about the family. Thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. 
all about the family. This is why it's so preposterous that the Novus Ordo Church, the Conciliar Church, the Church of Vatican II, has a synod on the family, and the things that they write on the synod of the family are just absolutely mind-boggling. It talks about how these documents were all seen and approved by Francis I. There's a section titled, Welcoming Homosexual Persons. Homosexuals have gifts and qualities to offer the Christian community. And then it asks, are our communities capable of providing them a welcoming home, accepting and valuing their sexual orientation? That's crazy. How do you answer someone that says, well, they're not hurting anybody, and they love each other? How do you answer that? Very simply. First and foremost, we say, okay, listen, God created us, and he put a purpose in everything. There's a reason why. He created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? <laughs> Adam and Eve. That's the order God established. And what did God tell Adam and Eve? Increase and multiply. If you break from that order that God has established, then there is no order. There are no rules and anything goes. And then you get into incest, bestiality, and all sorts of other perversions. Absolute perversions. Okay, that's just from using our reason. But the bigger reason is that God said no. That those who are this, adulterers, fornicators, effeminate, they will not see the kingdom of God. And if they're not going to see the kingdom of God, then what else? They're going to go to hell. They're going to go to hell. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of the sins of homosexuality. And the point to be made is that the synod on the family is talking about they have gifts and they have qualities to offer the Christian community. Like what? Crazy. Uh, I'm sure many of you heard of this apostolic constitution or apostolic, not constitution, apostolic exhortation that came out by Francis I, Amoris Laetitia. And it's kind of interesting because finally some people are saying, hey, this looks like heresy. Congratulations. This is the Latin for the joy of love. With an apostolic exhortation. Now I'm going to, don't want to get off a beaten path because sometimes you get off into this tangent and I'll think, how did I get here? And how do I get back to my topic? Okay. Okay, in this apostolic exhortation, the false pope says, that people that are living in an adulterous union, living in sin, can be given the sacraments. He's basically saying you can commit sacrilege. Obviously, that's not even the Blessed Sacrament anymore. They don't have a valid Mass. But this is the, the, the tragedy of it. Amoris Laetitia, there was a lot of confusion about what did he really mean, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But Francis the, Francis the First himself approved the interpretations from Malta, Germany, which allow for Holy Communion to be given to divorced and remarried Catholics. And on another occasion, Francis said, cohabitations with fidelity are real marriages and have the grace of a real marriage. You don't even have to get married. You could be living in sin, fornication, and that's okay. It says that he was, he was greeting a couple that preferred to live together without getting married. There's a cardinal, Cardinal Godfrey Daniels. He was appointed by Francis to be one of the experts at the synod on the family. 
And he thinks it's a I'm going to read right from a quote from he I, he says I think it's a positive development that states are free to open up civil marriage to gays if they want it. So he's given the green light by not just by what he says but by those who he appoints. On October 2nd 2016 a little over a year ago, Francis invited to the Vatican a woman who is transgender. So she's supposedly a man and was with her wife or the woman and he admitted them to the Vatican, welcomed them, invited them, took pictures with them and he clarified his use. He said he that was a her, but is a he. Crazy. And you know, how many have ever seen that picture? I'm sure maybe some of you have, haven't. If you look at the uh, Nova Soto watch, I just have to tell you, that transgender woman, she was ugly. I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a theological argument, but I'm just telling you, it's a <laughs> personal obligation. Francis I praised this Italian's foremost abortion promoter as one of the, gracio- the nation's forgotten greats. Her name was Emma Bonino. The Holy See, the Vatican II Church, regularly has coming to the Vatican speakers who are big on population control. As we know, we've heard this, he's talked about if, if, a, if a gay person is sincerely seeking the Lord and loves the Lord, who am I to judge them? We've heard of that before. Uh, interestingly, this is, the, we said, the 500th year of Luther's break with the church. Francis uh, spoke in an audience before a statue of Luther in the Vatican just prior to going to Sweden to launch the 500th anniversary of Lutheranism. The Vatican issued a stamp featuring Luther, and put on, out a document saying Catholics now recognize Martin Luther as a witness to the gospel. Really? Uh, in lectures past, conferences past, we've had quotes from Luther. Luther was a blasphemer. He said that, trying to justify his own sinful life, that he said, surely Christ was guilty of adultery. Luther said that. First, with the woman at the well, he was speaking to who he converted. He said, go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, you've spoken rightly because you have many husbands. And she says, I perceive her a prophet. There's nothing in scripture about anything blasphemous like that. And finally, the woman taken in adultery and Mary Magdalene, he said, surely Christ who is so righteous must have been guilty of adultery. Blasphemy. Luther said, sin boldly, but believe more boldly still. Nothing will separate us from the Lamb except for unbelief. If you commit murder and adultery thousands of times a day, you won't be lost as long as you believe. And this man is a witness to the gospel? That's the reason why when I talk to, unfortunately talk to some former parishioners of Mount St. Michael's who have left, I ask them, try to defend that. Try to explain that. I mean, how does it make any sense Don't be ridiculous. These men are supposed to be the vicars of Christ. They're supposed to speak on Christ's behalf. And they're saying these things. And as we get into another topic, we're going to, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. How long is it supposed to go? No, 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 I'm just asking. Can somebody tell me when we're supposed to end? Okay, we're going to do this very quickly here. Want to cover? T- uh, listen, we had a ton of stuff we wanted to cover. Uh, and after the break, what happens? Okay, good. Okay, so what we're going to do is just go through another topic here, and that is with regard to the modern church promoting. Spiritual adultery. And what is that? 
We know in the Old Testament that God had a covenant with his people. And this is the very first commandment. So spiritual adultery is against the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Very, very basic. If you read in moral theology and in the catechisms, it is a sin against faith to worship with other churches and other religions. A sin against faith. Canon 12, 58, forbids... active participation with the worship of non-Catholics. Non-Catholic worship. And in fact, Pope Pius XI in Mortalium Animos, he wrote a, a, a cyclical dedicated only to this topic of false ecumenism and true ecumenism. True ecumenism is to go and convert to Christ and to his church. False ecumenism is the idea that we need to get together and share the truth, and all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy, religious indifferentism. Pope Pius XI condemned false ecumenism. And false ecumenism has become the order of the day. It's become so common it's kind of like you get, how do you say, you become callous to it. You're not surprised at anything. It's almost like abortion. I mean, abortion is horrific. It's murder. But after so many years of abortion, it's kind of like it doesn't have the same, oh, this is horrible, because if you become kind of hardened to it. We shouldn't become hardened to it, but it's just become we've heard it so much. It's the same thing with false ecumenism. When you have the man that says he's the pope, Worshipping with the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims. Worshipping with the Protestants. And, and now they're celebrating Luther's break with the church. They're not popes. They are definitely infiltrators out to destroy people's faith. However, we need to, maybe after a break, get into this next section of the papacy, studying it in detail. We're going to study the Pope as supreme head of the church and the Pope as an individual because a lot of people get really fuzzy when they come into theology and say, well, we all know there's been heretical popes before. Oh, yeah? The nice book Father Bennett gave it to me because Father Bennett's a nice guy. <laughs> he gives free stuff at our priest meetings and so do the other priests, but when he says, I want this, my hand's up. If it's free, I'll be there, okay? <laughs> this is a translation of St. Robert Bellarmine about a defense of popes who said, popes said to have erred in the faith. Hasn't happened before. It's crazy. I was talking to someone not too long ago, and they said, well, oh, of course, Liberius and Honorius. I said, can I take a moment to scream? <laughs> that has been so often and so long ago refuted, it's not even funny. You could look up Cardinal Manning. He was one of the leading conservative cardinals at Vatican I in 1870. He wrote a book on the Vatican Council, and he explicitly talks about, we talked about Honorius, we talked about Liberius, we talked about these quote-unquote popes that supposedly fall in heresy. Never happened. See, what they're trying to say is that, oh, this, this happens all the time. This history church is full of... Popes were heretics, and we all know that. So these guys, like Francis and John Paul I and the rest of them, Paul VI, they can all be heretics and still be the Pope. And shame on you, Sede Vicantis, because you don't know history. 
crazy, absolutely crazy. So we want to get into some of these other topics here. Some of this might be repetition for you people who have been coming for the last 50 years, but some of you who are new might be a good refresher for you too as well. However, before we break, I sure hope there's more coffee. I don't think anybody's fell asleep. I didn't have to call out anybody yet. But I wanted to ask, if you have any questions, you know, we don't get a forum like this very often, but if you have any questions, you want to write them down. And I, if I see it as a question I like, I won't answer it. I'll just run out of time, okay? <laughs> no, we'll try to get through all of your questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. No such thing as a dumb question. Okay? But we want to, if you have any questions, we'll be happy. And also, when you ask the question, maybe if you didn't write it out, but you have a question, you raise your hand, then you call it out. I'll repeat it because this is being recorded. Then we'll try to give an answer, Okay? I have, to, I have to share with you one thing. It's kind of interesting. I'm sure some of you, if you drive a lot, I drive a lot uh, on, a, in a, on a road often and got to stay awake so you listen to different talk show hosts. But I remember back in 92, uh, one of our parishioners was trying to get me on the radio, so I was on, in uh, Omaha, uh, 1290K car. I was on the radio there. And I was also on WHO radio, which goes throughout all of uh, Iowa. Des Moines. And so you get on, you got your headphones, you got a microphone, and you know, he's talking about a Lady of Fatima and the changes in the church and traditional Catholic faith and, and all those things, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm looking, his name was Jan Michelson. I'm not sure if he's still on the radio, but he has a screen there and it has the caller's name and then a gist of what they're doing. And, and, and for Jan Michelson, he was, I think he was a, 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 a Calvinist. He wasn't Catholic, he was a Calvinist. And he was just there to entertain. I mean, just to entertain. And it, he wants ratings. He can care less about what I had to say, just ratings. So one lady, she says, you know, she's a, a Lutheran, and from what the bishop was saying, that, you know, I'm outside the church, and, and I'm trying to answer a question. He says, you're going to burn, lady. Oh, burn in hell. You're toast, ma'am. You're just toast. And like, <laughs> would you just shut up? You know, it's like. <laughs> so you're looking at, you're looking at the looking at the names, and I can see he can, he can choose what he wants, and he wants to try, take the most controversial. But somebody slipped in under the radar because he says, uh, you know, like it could be George from this part of Iowa. Bishop's a narrow-minded bigot. Oh, he went for that one. And then he said, it was kind of funny, he said, you know why? Because I'm a narrow-minded bigot. There's the only ones that stand for something, you know. It's kind of funny that he let this guy talk, and then the guy was agreeing with what we had to say. So sometimes you have to, if you want to be, you have to put something up there that's controversial, that they're going to go after it, and then, then you don't even say any of that. You say what you want to say. So there's one fellow who agreed with me, but in order to get on the air, I had to say I was a narrow-minded bigot. But no, not a narrow-minded bigot. I believe that there's an objective truth there, and it's, it's something that we can prove with objective evidence, and it's not like once they found the truth that I have to look at other things that are not true or I know are not true and aren't, aren't set with reality. If it's not true, it's not true. Just like that man who said he's a seven-year-old, second-grade Chinese woman is six foot five, etc. We don't have to pretend when something's not true that it's not true so we don't offend somebody. So have a lot of things to cover. Uh, we're only 15 minutes off course. Uh, I'm going to need to look at a schedule here. How long of a break, sister? Father. Got to stop at one. He, he, father, he's mean. Sometimes he, he, <laughs> all of a sudden I'll be like. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. We'll see you in 10 minutes, okay? Bless you.